If you look at the Methodist board outside the church, family worship, 10 o'clock. Now, of course, all the clergy are thinking, that sounds great. <laughs> you know, the rest of the day would be much easier. But, of course, it's not good because, actually, the reality is the people are fed by different types of services in different ways at different times in their lives. So in my own life, there have been moments when all I've ever needed was the unfriendly 8 o'clock service, <laughs> where I could just sneak in, pray, be close to God, and then sneak out. While on other occasions, yeah, I needed the gregarious and life-giving, more contemporary service. So that is well known. And what's interesting is those of you who are in congregations which are growing and developing, and I know there are many in this diocese, those will often find it's the extra service that you're planning or thinking about. You know, it might be a Teze service. It might be something sort of meditative and quiet. It might be paperless. It might be whatever. But those who are playing around with those sort of possibilities, what you're actually doing is you're saying... The paradox of extra services isn't that the church congregation gets smaller, but actually it gets bigger. And the reason for that is because somebody falls in love with what you're offering then, and they bring others, and you find yourself growing. So, that's one thing we had going for us. The second thing we have going for us is that we encourage people to learn a skill set. Now, the weird thing about being an Episcopalian is it's actually quite hard work. <laughs> You know, you actually have to... Now, the good thing about paperless service, you know paperless service where you just sit there and it's on screens and you can show the liturgy and everything. At least you know where to look. But the problem with when you've got to use the book is that, I mean, you know, S162. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, you know, it starts in one place and then you get to four Eucharistic prayers. And they're off. And then what's really irritating is the proper preface isn't in there. <laughs> so you turn your page frantically trying to find out why, they, why is this guy at the front saying something which isn't in the book. So, but in a paradoxical sort of way, that's one of the strengths of our tradition. The fact you've got to juggle three books. <laughs> the fact you've got to learn. Now, we've got to train. We've got to train people. It's cruel to just leave them there, <laughs> trying to find which Eucharistic prayer they're on, and not to explain at all that, yeah, for different seasons, there's, there's going to be a couple of sentences which aren't in there. But the very fact that you are slowly trained, in the paradox of being human is that you appreciate something much more when it's harder to understand. In other words, you know when you go to an art gallery? You know, you walk through an art gallery. Oh, look, another Monet. <laughs> Impressionist. And you wave your hand and so on. And then you go with somebody who really knows their way around the art. And they stand next to you. And they explain what you should be seeing in this picture. Or the Super Bowl on Sunday. You know... It, it's a Super Bowl was my way into American football. It was a great gift to me. And sitting next to people who explain why they keep stopping and starting <laughs> and how long it takes to cover 10 yards was really important. And as I started to understand, I started to appreciate the plays. And I got quite upset when, what was his name, R3? RG3. RG3. Yeah, I got really upset. I got into that game. I suddenly realised I crossed a Rubicon. <laughs> I now understood the extraordinary nature of the game. But it takes time. You're introduced, you're inducted, you're trained. You learn to see what there is to appreciate. And the third reason why, so the first was that we had more than one service. That's the reason why we did well in the 90s. The second was that we actually require a skill set for people to learn. 
And as people learn it, they appreciate it. And the third is, yeah, the we're of faith, which is both generous and thoughtful. There are lots of people out there who hanker for a faith which says it's okay to believe in evolution. <gasps> I mean, it's amazing. Thank you very much. It's true. It's okay to not necessarily think that strolling around the walls seven times and they all come tumbling down happened as literal history, or Joshua really managed to stop the sun moving to enable a large number of people to be slaughtered. There's no time to have doubts and questions about those narratives. That sort of thoughtfulness and generosity, both in respect to women and minorities and gay and lesbians, has actually was a 90s strength of our tradition. Now, we've had a difficult initial decade in this century, and the difficulty was simply that, yeah, uh, we were at the heart of the culture wars, and some people had real problems with that, and they decided to call it a day and leave the Episcopal Church. So it's been a difficult decade. But all the evidence is that we're coming to the end of it. And what you should expect to start seeing happening, if we get it right, it won't just happen, we'll have to be attentive, we'll have to be thoughtful, is all the factors that were working effectively for us in the 90s are going to start kicking in in this decade. That'll be two, three, four years. But one thing we must start doing is get away from this narrative of despair. Because the narrative of despair is being used by those who have a real problem with our tradition. And what we all need to start doing is saying, look, I don't think the main line's going to disappear. Look, I don't think the Episcopal Church is going to disappear. It's going to change. The particular congregation I'm in might not be there in this form, but the tradition of which I'm a part is going to endure. Do you know, it's very interesting. Uh, we're, 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 we do periodically inflict wounds on ourselves as a tradition. One weird thing we do, and this is a little campaign I want to solicit some support on, right? So you, uh, you know, I, I admit to have hermeneutic of suspicion about this, if you like. One thing I want us to start doing is count more accurately people who are part of our tradition. So we start turning some of the headlines around. We start turning the perceptions around. I'll give you two constituencies, which for some extraordinary reason we don't count. Constituency number one is we don't count anybody who goes to a liturgical, Episcopal liturgical experience in one of our 1,200 Episcopal schools in the United States. Thank you. <laughs> And do you know, that's so stupid. My son goes to St. Stephen's and St. Agnes. He goes to an obligatory required piece of a Eucharist. Every week, he's at St. Stephen's and St. Agnes through the school year, and he's never counted as a participant at an Episcopal liturgy. Now, you might say, well, excuse me, he's required to go. To the right! <laughs> Let's bring back a little bit more compulsion. And, but he's there along with the rest of the, whatever it is, 1,200 students in that school, we're probably, as a result, not counting over 38,000 people a week who participate in a liturgy in an Episcopal school. We don't count them. They're invisible. I'll give you another illustration where we don't count them. We don't count them in any of our retirement complexes. And we've got, hang on, I've got the number here. We have uh, over 156 retirement complexes linked with the Episcopal Church. And we estimate that actually we're not counting over, over 16,000 people in the Episcopal liturgy every week. We don't count them. We undercount our numbers by over 50,000 in total. 
Why do we do that? Yeah, yes, I do. You know, it's just very puzzling. So what we need to start doing is we need to challenge the narrative despair. We need to become much more self-confident about our future. We need to start recognising that there are things we can do to make ourselves attractive and welcoming. We need to start counting the numbers more accurately. We need to actually start letting people know that what we offer is a way of faithful discipleship where you can grow to love the Lord Jesus more effectively, where you can discover that imperative connection with the divine that makes us fully human. And we need to do that work. And what was true in the recent past, 2005, will and can be true of the Diocese of Delaware going forward. And we all need to play our part in making that happen. Thank you very much for listening.